Okay, hi everyone. Thank you so much um, for coming today. Um, it's lovely to see so many of you here. Um, I think you'll agree with me when I say um, it's a real uh, great honour and privilege to have Tana Prize winner and Tour de Force of the Contemporary Art World, Jeremy Dell, with us here today. So thank you very much for coming. Um, Before we start, just to give everyone an idea of what's happening, Jeremy will be giving a talk and then we will open the floor up to questions. So if you have any thoughts throughout the talk, make sure to leave them down um, to ask Jeremy after. Um, and also just a note to say thank you very much to Christy, who has sponsored this event and allowed it to be free for all you university members. So thank you very much and um, that's what I do. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you. Firstly, uh, apologies for wearing shorts. Uh, I'm wearing shorts. At I regret to tell you that it's actually quite warm in London today, much warmer than here, so I thought it would be more in Oxford, but uh, bear with me on that one. That's why I had the lights dimmed. Um, so, I've got quite a lot of things to get through, so I might skip over a few things, but I'm just, just kind of showing you highlights, effectively. And I know there's some artists here, but I might even ask for a show of hands. Can I just see any artists in the audience? Just out of interest. I don't know, it's like sort of 50 50. Right. I didn't go to art college, by the way, I studied art history, so I'm not showing any favouritism to the art historians. I came to art in a sort of strange way. My, my school were really not, my, the teacher at my school was really not very happy with me with doing art, so I never progressed through the age of 11 or 12, really. So that's a sort of, I got into art by going to museums, by going to galleries, I went to London, and that was something that was very important to me. And then I had the opportunity to do art history. And I just thought that's the closest I'm going to ever get to art is to be an art historian, to study paintings and work in a museum, which um, I did a degree in art history. And then I very, realized very quickly that I couldn't have being in a museum environment because it wasn't as exciting as, as I thought it might be. Um, so I, it was not really for me. So in the end, I gradually became an artist almost by accident. I worked in a commercial art gallery for a while as a technician. Very, very kind of disastrous time in terms of my sort of technical skills at zero, so it's a very bad moment for that gallery. Uh, but, uh, so I ended up becoming an artist. Uh, I lived with my parents for quite a long time until I was in my 30s, and I, uh, the thing that really liberated me, because I was making little posters and um, on a computer, I was sort of printing out things and living in the streets. Sort of doing printing and never really did painting but um, I did an exhibition at my parents' house when we went on holiday um, which I really enjoyed uh, but really the thing that sort of liberated me from making objects and, do, and being able to just do things was an idea I had for a brass band to play acid house music so this is a sort of traditional form of music making being um, play uh, this is brass bands and playing acid house which is sort of mid to late 80s dance music so in a sense, a kind of absurd idea, a stupid idea, which a lot of my work starts from a position of absurdity or strangeness, and then you try and prove that the idea is actually okay and it works. And one way of proving that it works is this diagram which sort of came into my head in a way, and it shows how I think about history, about popular music, about popular culture, and it's trying to connect these two disparate musical forms and trying to work out what they had in common as opposed to what they didn't have in common, because what they don't have in common is very clear in a sense. But for me, it all gravitates around the middle section, uh, around the media hysteria against acid house, but also against the miners, doing the miners' strike because they use brass bands, obviously, as the kind of soundtrack to a lot of demonstrations and marches and so on. And so for me, this image came into my head of how, how you can tell a story through music. So basically, I'm trying to tell, you know. It's a big ask in a way. I'm trying to tell the history of 20th century Britain for a music project. Because what we have here is a, really a diagram about how you go from being an industrial culture, which is the culture of brass bands, to a digital service economy type culture, which is acid house and the parties that were made. This is about social solidarity, and this is about partying, but they meet in the middle, the civil unrest and the media hysteria. So that, Diagram. It's a potted history, really, is an attempt to tell and create a narrative, but a musical narrative. And this was the best way to explain it. And this is an image that came into my head almost immediately when I thought about this idea. 
and then you have the reality you do it. You have to, you know, the idea is kind of easy bit often, doing it is more complicated. But having said that, working with a brass band, like I said, it really liberated me because I realised that the public and people were, were, were up for stuff. You know, the idea was odd, but the public, i.e. the band and the manager of the band, were very happy to do this thing and see how it went. And so it became an adventure with me and the band. And that's them playing at the music festival. It's just sort of an incredible, massive audience. And it was just a lot of fun. And it was a sort of step into the unknown. And from then on, I realized that actually the public were a material in effect. It's something I wanted to work with because it was a lot more interesting than doing other kinds of work whereby you sort of knew the result before you started. But this is, you never really knew what to expect. If you work with the public or you work in the public realm, you don't really, you can't control it. And we'll see some examples of that later. That's another music festival. Sue's on the phone. Oh, it's your phone. No, not to worry. So that diagram you saw, I made basically a film about that diagram a few years ago. I made a film about Acid House music and about Britain basically. I attempted to tell the story of Britain through the music, the dance music of Britain in the mid to late 80s. And so I made a film that really was also trying not to make the normal music documentary, which is basically a lot of people sitting in their recording studios with their records in the background talking about what it was like in the 80s and how amazing it was and how it's not as good now and uh, how many drugs they took, and all that kind of stuff. It was a sort of middle-aged man documentary. <laughs> and so I set the film, the film was set in a, a real classroom with students, politics students, in London, and I basically gave a talk, similar to what I'm doing now, but about Britain in the 80s, and how this music changed Britain, but why Britain was ready to hear this music, and what it meant for people. So in a, in a sense, it was a sort of an emotional story, but also as a political story. And this is one part of the film where the young people do like a little practical class. It was filmed over a day, it was an exhausting day, and they're just playing some of the instruments that were made in the 80s and sometimes in the 70s that really made that music. And again, it's the idea of liberation through music, through this technology. So that was a film, and um, I don't know if any of you have seen it, but I'm going to show you the trailer. And in the way the trailer, explains the film in where that diagram just explains it because it, sh it, it shows you all the different elements that were in the film. So it wasn't just about music, it was about Britain. And for these young people, oh, most of the young people who are in the class, their parents have not been born in Britain. So they didn't have any folk memory of Britain in the 80s because their parents weren't in Britain. So stories around politics, about minor strike, around Margaret Thatcher, around the traveller movement, and music and so people's social lives. Were, they were really hearing it for the first time. This is the trailer. No? I'm going to play the trailer because I love it. This is just a still from the film. We'll actually see this still in the trailer. Um, but like I said, it sort of explains everything. I'm going to turn the volume up. It might be too loud. We'll see. Okay.
also what was interesting for me was I was trying to make a film in which you saw, you saw the footage through the eyes of the young people. So the young people were sitting, listening to me sort of talk, maybe drone on a bit. Sorry, drone on a bit. Sorry, I'm in the mic. And it was basically you're seeing that footage maybe new and new because you're, you're seeing their reactions to it because they wouldn't have seen it before. Um, uh, but that is to everyone in the place. Some of the footage you saw of the police and the police horses was taken from a very violent confrontation in the minor strike in 1984. June the 18th, 1984. The Battle of Albury. Something I saw as a teenager on TV. And it's something I wanted to... I mean, the great thing about being an artist is you can actually research your interests. So I'm interested in lots of different things. And so you can actually just follow, pursue your obsessions, your interests. And I wanted to know more about this riot, effectively, this, this battle that I'd seen on TV, because it was incredibly dramatic. 15,000 people is in the countryside. The police were pursuing uh, striking miners up a hill on horseback with dogs. And it was, it was effectively a rout. It was like a medieval rout. So I, I had the idea of finding out more about it. This is from the actual battle itself, before things got nasty. What you might see, and I always talk about this, is that the insignia on the helmet of the policeman might be Metropolitan Police, so the police were taken up to the north of England because the police from London had no interest in mining culture, in working class culture, industrial culture at least, and so they were the sort of most violent, unpleasant police to these people because they didn't know them. If you were a local policeman, you probably went to school with the people that you were sort of pushing and shoving and maybe battling with. But the London police had no interest in them as human beings, effectively, and it was very lucrative for them as well. So that, I think he's saying something to a policeman from London about something he just done someone. Anyway, I had an idea. Uh, again, a very odd, absurd, potentially risky idea, which was to recreate this battle in real time with members of reenactment societies and with um, former miners and their families. And it was just going to be a public event over a day with 20,000 people watching, uh, taking part. In the end, we couldn't do it with that number because it just wasn't possible for budget reasons and many other logistical reasons. But we did a reenactment on the site for the public to come and watch. So this is still from it. Um, and, and it was filmed, and the filming paid for the reenactment itself. This is the second part when we went through a village. Um, which was not really seen at the time because the TV cameras weren't watching that part. They weren't expecting that to happen. That's when kind of most of the violence, the worst violence happened at the, at the TV camera sort of site. And so what I was trying to do was to raise a ghost effectively or some sort of phantom in a sense of this memory of this event, which had been erased. A lot of memory became erased after the strike. People were like humiliated. But also the government, and the government Tony Blair at the time was not interested in this sort of thing at all. This was old labour, this was the past, the ancient past. And so I was trying to sort of do a post-mortem or a crime scene reenactment, if you think of it like that, the way that you know when crimes are committed, murders are committed, that uh, they reenact the crimes to draw people's memory. So it's a sense that there's some kind of reenactment. Or, or like digging up the body and poking around and looking at it to try to work out. So some sort of post-mortem of the dead body. But it had to be a public event. So this was something that was very important for me, that it was a public event. And we worked with local people, but also we worked with members of reenactment societies, people that do this every weekend. Um, and this, and that. <laughs> because I don't even have been to these reenactments, they find this kind of comical element to them. And I thought, well, these guys, and it is mainly men that do reenactment. I wanted them to do a reenactment, a political reenactment, in the place where something had happened with veterans from the battle. Which, of course, you can't do if you're doing battles like this, because people have been dead for 600, 500 years. I don't know quite how long. Long time. So it was an opportunity for them to come up against real history, living history, as they call it, and just see what they made of it. And, of course, there was a lot of tension, because they met the former miners, and they were terrified of them because they thought these men were sort of revolutionary, Marxist, whatever. And they got very nervous around them. 
which made the uh, reenactment much better because there was actual emotion from the miners because they were reenacting their lives. And the reenactors couldn't believe that emotion. And um, so for them, it was, a, it was really, I was really questioning them and their view of history. It wasn't, this is a political reenactment, it wasn't a reenactment that was just about armour and guns and swords and mammals and horses and so on. This is actually a political event. Um, so in a sense I was trying to see if it changed their view of British history, but also the idea of what is a battle and what is a civil war as well. And surprisingly they were very, afterwards, they were terrified before it and sort of during it I think a lot of them. But when we swapped up, some miners played police and some police played miners, and we swapped teams as it were because they were very worried that it would end up in being like a real revolution, which of course was never going to happen. But, so that was 2001, and in a way I never thought I'd make it work as big as that in terms of the production, but I immediately did, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Very briefly, I'll just explain that a lot of the work, like that work, and also the work with Acid Brass, with the Brass Band playing at the House Museum, and the film, are all works based around the idea of industrial culture and digital culture, and how industry ends, and what happens when it ends. What do people do, what do individuals do, what do communities do, and effectively what does a country do? And so this photograph, which I saw about 15 years ago, kind of embodies that idea, but almost accidentally. It's a photograph taken by, taken of um, Adrian on the right, a wrestler. He went back, he was a wrestler from Wales. He went back to the mine where he worked as a child, almost, as a 15 year old, to have his photograph taken with his father, who he hated. And so you have this incredible tension again in the image and the storytelling element of it as well. Um, sort of Dickensian in a way, but also futuristic, science, science fiction almost. Um, and so I saw this picture and I couldn't really work out what was going on in it. So I had to meet Adrian, so I found him online. We talked and I ended up making a film about him. But for me this image really embodies, and literally in, in their, both their bodies, the changes going on in Britain as we struggled to become a country that was post-industrial. But Adrian was doing this almost a pioneer, like a prophet, effectively, doing this really before anyone else, without even realising it, trying to trans transcend his uh, environment and reinvent himself as a different kind of human being, effectively, like a 21st century human being. So I made a film about him, um, and a fascinating life, fascinating life. Um, he's still alive. And he's in his 70s and he still works out, he's got an incredible physique. He, he never took um, steroids, so he's alive basically. And like a lot of people who took steroids died in the 50s and 60s. He's a very tough guy, still very tough, very short, he's tiny, quite shorter than me. Um, you know, hence why he has stacked heels and so on. But um, in what he did as a human being, I think it's, it's incredible. The, the willpower to do it. That's him as a sort of 15 year old. And became a bodybuilder, became a gay icon without realising it. Because London was photographed by a lot of men who were actually making, uh, not pornographic as such, but magazines for other men to look at, sort of body culture magazines, and then became worse. So that picture of him you saw there, for me, is kind of like William Blake. I don't know if you know the poem Jerusalem, or the song Jerusalem, as it is now. It was the hymn, isn't it? It's actually in the hymn book. And, uh, it's this idea of what, what price think if he came to Britain during the Industrial Revolution on his charity fire wearing his gold and robes and so on. And in a sense, that's what Adrian is doing here. He's like this Blake human figure from the future visiting the past, or will soon be the past. He can just wave, wave the colours of everyone as well. I mean, if, this photograph is not in colour, which probably makes it more effective. And in a sense, for me, as an art historian, my art historian's this to me is like as good as any Renaissance painting. It's not really the prodigal son as such, but it's like the ambassadors by Holbein and all these great, greatly staged Renaissance portraits or, or, or paintings, or allegorical paintings, it's mythological almost. He's a mythic character. So I made a film about Adrian, but that's a little diversion. We have to get on to other things. 
Um, sometimes failure can lead to uh, interesting places. I did a show, I had a section called My Failures. At the end of the show, all the things I hadn't done, which I'd like to have done. And in the end, I think there were four things, five things in the show. And I did, ended up doing two of them anyway. And this was one, I was selected for the fourth plinth um, shortlisted. Uh, so it's five, five artists. I was, um, I was going to choose two. I didn't get it. My idea was never going to be chosen. And it's like, well, it was almost a challenge, you know? You put an idea and it's like, let's see how far you can go with this, how you can stomp this. And it was to take a car that had been destroyed in Iraq during the um, invasion and the subsequent civil war insurgency and plonk it on the 4th Clinton Trafalgar Square. Something like this. This is Photoshop, by the way. Had that there. Not a car that had been used as a bomb, very importantly, just a car that had been destroyed, because it's the closest you're going to get to a body, in a sense. But Clinton's are just the right size for someone on a horse to be on. Um, and so the scale worked very well. So I basically wanted a car rotting, looking horrible as a piece of evidence to go on the plinth and just rot there over a period of a year, year and a half. Didn't get chosen. Not really a surprise when you think about it. But I did end up getting a car um, and taking it and putting it in a museum in America. And then, for me, much more interestingly, taking it on a road trip, effectively. Because it was, it was in a show in New York and then it was going to LA. And so I thought, well, what's the point? You know, you've got to transport this thing across America. It's a classic road trip, is it not? Let's take the car and show the car America, and show America to the car. Um, and so we took it across America. I went with a, the Iraqi citizen who worked with the American army and with an American soldier. So we kind of covered ourselves because we weren't really sure how dangerous this might be as a thing, as a, as a thing to do. Um, and we just stopped off in towns and cities. The car was always on display, so you're going down the freeway, it's being seen by hundreds, if not thousands of people. It had a sign on it. I'll go back to the sign, it's quite cool. This car was destroyed, destroyed by a bomb in a Baghdad marketplace on March the 5th, 2007. So it's very bland, the way we described it and showed it. We weren't making an anti war statement or anything like that. We were just showing something to people. And so you bump into people. This guy was going to a funeral, he's a vet, and he stopped to look at it, and he wants to know what it's all about, and that's him talking to the Iraqi citizen, Isan, who was a big guy, but also this incredibly well-read and knowledgeable. And so could talk his way into and out of any situation, as could the American soldier, which is very helpful to think about it. These, these, the, the, both of them had been in near-death experiences, and so they knew how to negotiate things and situations. So often you'd find that Isam would start, some guy would start talking to Isam and be very sceptical and very white and very suspicious and think he's a terrorist, you know, he looks like a terrorist, what are you doing here? And by the end, he'd be totally turned around. Isam knew the Bible, he knew the Quran, he quote biblical quotations of Christians, you know, and so he, he was an incredible person to this is what we showed to the public. We gave out flyers because actually it's very unique to do that. It's our interpretation, what the museum would call interpretation. Um, you can probably read that. We called it the ongoing situation in Iraq. Um, opportunity to discuss Iraq itself. And then we talk about the people. Very bland. And we actually criticised <coughs> by people for being like that rather than being anti-war. We didn't want to do that. We would have set up a space of conversation, of argument, and potential violence on ourselves. So um, that's why we did that. And so that's what, you know, it's how it looked a lot of the time. People just coming, most people had no idea that, you know, when they left their houses that morning that they were going to see this. We went to a lot of campuses because a lot of young people on the campus have been to Iraq and Afghanistan because you enlist in the army and uh, your college fees, you, you, you can be called up at any time. So a lot of them are called up. You know, an art student who get on a submarine loading tomahawk missiles into the silos to fire at the Iraqi army and was totally traumatized by that. He had a notebook with a kind of pornographic fire and imagery in 
and is totally disturbed by what he's done, effectively. So there's a lot of stories from that. When we made little films, we sort of did a kind of bad documentation, if I can call it that. You know, this is the sort of quality of photographs that we had. Um, I just had a little digital camera. We didn't want to overload the public the photograph and the document at all because I think sometimes artists can over-document things and it's not about the moment, it's about the documentation. And that's maybe increasing, so if you think about it. That's the student, there we go, that's the student, the art student. So it's this, you know, it's this strange veteran, and then he had all the patches of red he and so on. So he was still kind of into the culture of it, but it totally ruined it, he knew it. And so he was totally sort of traumatised and he was interviewed, he showed his notebooks and talked about And so there's a photograph of someone actually probably on the way to Coachella Music Festival. We went, we went to Coachella, not inside Coachella, we parked up there to see what the public made of. So, in a way, that project was, for me, my favourite, if you can call it favourite, it's a weird word to use, but it's the project that I got the most satisfaction for because of the, the absolute uncertainty of going and doing that, of standing on a street, giving a flyer to someone, you have no idea who this person is. Their husband could have been killed a month previously in Iraq, or their brother, or the maid, or they could, they might even be an ex soldier themselves, or anti war, or whatever. So you just have to treat everyone in a very similar way, and talk to them in a very similar way, and then people would start talking to you. The car is now in the Imperial War Museum in uh, London. It's an old photograph, but it's in the sort of central lobby, which, are, which is an incredible place for it to be, to be seen by so many people, because we were literally going to jump it, we didn't want to do it at the end of the video, the tour. Ah, oh, right, okay. A lot of death and destruction on this tour, as you can tell. I think it's all it's been is death and destruction so far. But, uh, or conflict. This obviously is um, an image of Australia in 2019 when they had massive bushfires. And someone wrote to me and said, Do you want to do doing this fundraising? I did I had a sort of side side career making prints for people who asked me. And so I had a career of sorts, if you can call it that, making fundraising prints. And they said, Do you want to do a print of um, raising funds for charity to, to rehouse people and work with the animals that have been injured during the bushfires. I don't know if you remember them, they were absolutely apocalyptic. I said, yeah, of course, and I had an idea. I said, well, I, I know what I want. I want to take, um, I don't know if you know Lachlan Murdoch is. He basically runs Fox News now. He's with the Murdoch son. He's the favoured son. He's the far right, white supremacist, etc., etc., climate change denial. And, and worse, if it's possible. And I thought, well, okay, what I'll do is I'll get a photograph of Latin Murdoch's house in Australia, and I'll pretend that it's been burned down in a bushfire by Photoshop. So in a way, very similar to this image, but a fancy house in Sydney Harbour. And when people start having a go at you, you get quite nervous, because you don't really know where it's going to go. And sometimes when you engage with the public, thinking you're trying to explain something, they just come back even more, and even more extreme. And so it's quite weird, actually, um, because, of course, they want the response to start a conversation, to screenshot it, to show it in. And so I didn't respond to it, but I was quite nervous. But then, so his grandchildren got in touch with me, his uh, brother-in-law, his son-in-law got in touch with me, and then their friends got in touch with me saying I'm disgusting. Well, someone who liked it then said, I'm sorry, I didn't realise what I'd liked. That's terrible. Someone liked the sky. And so it became this like, ridiculous thing but of like, rich, insanely rich, privileged people complaining about a hundred pound print. But it, was, it actually made me think, ah, oh, this is, I'm onto something. I'm quite enjoying this. And so I had an idea anyway. I was doing something in Australia in 2020, which didn't happen in 2020 for obvious reasons, happened the following year. And it's related to this. It was for a festival in, in Melbourne. And I said, what I really want to do is make a bust, uh, a wax model of Rupert and Lachlan Murdoch uh, as a candle and um, burn them. <laughs> and do, like, uh, uh, 12 hours or 24 hours, like a vigil, like a religious artwork. 
this is basically a religious arbor I'm making. This is a test burn of Rupert. Um, but it is. It's beautiful. I mean, it's a beautiful thing. And I just thought, well, you don't really need to explain yourself here. It's going to be called, it's called Father and Son. And as an art historian, of course, there are many precedents for making polychrome or, what, or sculptures of, of death and destruction, of torture, of, of, um, of suffering. It's, it's, you know, Christian religion, Christian imagery, 50% of it is of people being killed or being tortured in some way, I would argue. The other 50% is a woman with a child. But, you know, there's a lot of unpleasant stuff in Christian imagery. And so I was thinking about uh, Spanish polychrome sculpture. I was thinking about um, candles um, and, and uh, the use of candles and so on in churches. And so I did, I made it. I did make it. It's called Father and Son. And as a build-up, we couldn't say what we were doing because if we had, it would have been destroyed. Because the Murdoch Press sort of run Melbourne. It's his hometown. It's where his parents were, it's where he was born. And so he's incredibly powerful there. And so it's just called Father and Son. And we, we were using religious quotations about mortality, about death, about power, about however powerful you are now, you would still, you would still be dust at some point in your life. I mean, amazing quotations. Much better than what I just said, because they're in the Bible, so they're very well written. And so, um, again, torture. So we made it. This is it. Um, it was a public, even though you can't see any public there, it was a public event. It was the first weekend after lockdown, when they had a 255 day lockdown in Melbourne. And so no one knew what it was. So people came and they saw Lachlan. So Lachlan's standing, obviously. He's the son, he's the sort of um, the enemy, as it were. Well, they both are. And so um, they burnt over a period of 12 hours. It was in a deconsecrated church as well. I mean, ideally, I'd like to do it in a church during a service. It would be much, that for me, would be the ideal environment. But not many people wanted to suppose this. It was a very tricky thing to kind of find a host for. And of course, online it went preserved, which was kind of what you want now. When you do something, you let the public document it. You really let the document it. So that's the end of the day, at the end of the 12 hours. Latin's face fell off. You can see it there. But weirdly, Rupert Murdoch's face just kind of caved in a bit on the angle. So, Father shall outlive the sun, which is kind of an interesting thought. Um, that's a very different image. So that's something I did last year, but it, but it was um, it's done in sort of massive secrecy because everyone was worried that we would all get totally destroyed by the press. And of course, nothing in those papers. They just ignored it as if it didn't happen. And even his grandchildren didn't write to me. They learned their lesson that they committed a foolish by writing to me about something else. Um, this is a project I made to commemorate first day of Battle of the Sun. And I was just thinking about memorials. What, you know, war memorials are these big things, basically, aren't they? They're these big objects that you go to. It's a very kind of old-fashioned way of thinking about it. <coughs> it's Neolithic. Like you go to Stonehenge, or something like that. They're like big grave stones, effectively. And you go there, you do something, and then you leave, and that's it. So I wanted to make a war memorial that actually intervened in your life and got into your life, even though you weren't expecting it. And it was a secret memorial in a sense because trained up about 1500 people to intervene into daily life on June, July 1st 2016. No one knew it was going to happen. They were wearing very accurate costumes, uniforms I should say, and they just hung out in the room. And if you went up to one of these people who was doing it, they gave you a little card explaining what the project was and why just, just with someone's name and date of birth and the fact they died at the song. So it was a sort of viral work in a sense, because it was bodies going through, travelling through the body of Britain, effectively, the UK. That's Manchester. And they were told to make eye contact, but that, I don't, I feel slightly sorry for that guy. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of eye contact going on. There we go. So yes, and I wanted the, wanted the soldiers to hang out in modern contemporary Britain, or contemporary Britain. 
not in heritage spaces, not castles or churches, to go to places that in, two, in 1916 you wouldn't even be able to comprehend with your mind, just blow your mind to think of a shop like that here, or the Apple Store, and so they Tesco's. So they went to like ugly contemporary Britain, which for me was very important. I just hung out, looked at people, and then just moved on. So like this idea of a virus again, just traveling on trains, on buses, and so on, and just being present. Of course, it went viral digitally as well, which is, again, something I was very happy for. Um, this was the training. I did a lot of training because you want to sort of create a group of people that are like soldiers, effectively. They know each other, they trust each other, all of those things. So there's a lot of trust building exercise like this. We did a lot of exercise around um, what happens if someone's drunk and they kind of swear at you or try and thump you or something like that. Um, a lot of that went to Northern Ireland, so we were slightly concerned about that. People in uniforms walked through the streets of Northern Ireland. But what actually did happen was that people got very upset seeing it. I did want, I did want to upset people. I did want to upset people. I actually wanted to, I, I write them in my notebook, I want to make children cry. Because I did, I, did, I wanted it to be unsettling. But people were unsettled actually by their, their lives now, not then. In a way, as much now as then. It was a week after the Brexit vote, vote, and I don't know if you remember that week after where the Conservative Party was, was at war with itself, with all these characters, you know, trying to be the leader and just stabbing each other in the back. It was just the most horrendous, chaotic moment in British history. And I think people, when they saw this, they thought, all oh, right, so this is another version of Britain. This is something about sacrifice. So what about sacrifice? Whereas with what we've seen with the Brexit vote and these right wing politicians, I would argue, was they were willing to sacrifice Britain for their careers. Whereas these men were willing to sacrifice their lives for Britain. So it's a very different thing. I think people instinctively understood this without having to even talk about it. So the reaction of the public was very, on the whole, was incredibly emotional. This is a soldier giving out. Partisan, I should say, giving out the cards to these guys here that had the, the fact that he was a local man, he's representing a local man who was killed on the 1st of July. So, 100 years previously. I'm kind of racing through, but I know I've, I'm, I'm getting to this, so I'm very happy that I've got to this. So, before COVID, before the war in Ukraine, I think everybody <coughs> I was certainly absolutely obsessed with um, Brexit. And what I saw to be a kind of disaster, a social and physical disaster that it was. And I went to some, I went to Parliament Square during all the votes in 2019. I don't know if you remember that time, it was very confusing. There's all these different votes and the parliamentary procedure was changing and amendments and so on. And there, every time there was a vote happening, there were people outside on both sides making noise and lobbying effectively. And it was absolute. Chaos. It was chaos. I've never seen anything like it in Britain. It was very disturbing and fascinating, equally fascinating and disturbing. And it was really something that I'd never thought I'd see happen in Britain. This sort of country sort of tearing itself apart. And I don't have to tell you, just, you know, we've all lived through it. But it was very disturbing. And there were a lot of people, far right people, there who were very intimidating, these men especially. The text underneath is actually, I made a film basically about the situation. And the text underneath is actually from a speech by Nigel Farage, but it actually sums up. Like you could use it against him effectively. Um, so there's, there's a small group of men who were every demo, and since when, and I, I even saw them at, oh, not even, of course, I saw them anti vax demos as well. And then I saw them at Black Lives Matters, Black Lives Matters demo. They just go to demos now and see and observe. Um, but they were big in the anti vaccine lot of these men. And they were there and they were very threatening. They were even sort of threatened police. They knew the law, so they knew what they could and couldn't do. And I sort of followed them around and tried to interview them, some of them. And I got an interview with a few people, not any of these guys, but one I got an interview with. Uh, There's a lot of anti Semitism, uh, very open anti Semitism. Anti uh, immigrant feeling was the other really big thing that stuck out. And of course, a lot of references to the Second World War, which was just people just going on and on about the 
Second World War and going on about times in British history where they weren't even alive, saying how much better it was then, even though they literally were maybe one year old or two. What it was like, you know, Britain in the early 70s, and that's when it was great and all this sort of stuff. So that was really interesting. And I think it's, you know, the Second World War in Britain has become almost like a religious war. It's like a sacred moment in our history. And these people were absolutely venerated the idea of the Second World War and saw, saw it as our greatest moment ever. And, and everything that came after was a disaster, um, including the NHS. So I spent a lot of time there. Well, I, I went six or seven times, which, believe me, is enough. You, you got home after spending time with these people, and you really were just exhausted. It was mentally really exhausting me, because it was so unpleasant to be. And um, a lot of conspiracy theorists as well, obviously. I called the film Putin's Happy, by the way, because obviously he was very happy by the result of the votes. Anything that weakens Britain, weakens Europe, weakens our relationship to Europe, is in his favour. And also his name came up a few times, or references to him came up a few times with people, um, as being a good person, and uh, we'll see him so. this, is, this is literally the first thing I saw when I got to the demo in January, was this guy shouting at politicians inside the car's house, screaming and shouting at them, being traitors and calls. And I interviewed him in, in, as well. But that was my sort of act, isn't it? Okay, I'm going to show you a clip now of a woman. Really, kind of a, in a way, the most terrifying person was a woman I interviewed from the West Country, who looks like the most normal person, but had been totally radicalised by the British media, but also other media outlets over the years, and became this person that's. It's really scary because if it could happen to her, it could happen to anyone, that's how I felt. And she, in a way, was a very typical person that would be there. Just fizzing with rage and with disinformation. It's not nice, by the way, I'm going to show you, but here we go. I've come all the way up from Somerset because I feel so strongly about the betrayal that's happened by our MPs. That's why I'm looking at. It's quite a strong word, betrayal. I mean, it is. Yeah. She's kicked Brexit under the bus yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Did you feel that before yesterday as well? Yes. This is my third time here. And I've been to two other values as well. I feel so strongly about this. Yeah. Well, so, can you explain your phrase, the phrase here, really, what does that mean to you? It means support British business, support British employees and employees. We stop moaning about the EU all the time. We do six. Six percent of our trade is done with the EU. Six percent. Ninety-four percent of it is done through WTO. Morrison's have a, 
came and protested before. No, no, no. We, are, we, are, we, are, we are not. We have enjoyed it so much. We like, are really amazing. Yeah. 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 I like the fact that people actually come up to you and actually want to talk to you. The people are actually getting involved. I never thought there would be so much involvement. It's like there's actually people coming and bringing people together. Yeah. Discussions. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Many, yeah. so yeah. many, and people are just so nice. Are you worried about the future of Britain? I mean, of course we are. Yeah. It affects us it's our life. future too. We're the people that are living in this afterwards. Everyone's yeah. gonna die away. Yeah. <laughs> Did you find after the vote, you saw that people became more racist to you? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So they, they saw they got their way out of it with the vote, so they thought they could express their racism. Now that the country's leaving the EU, mm. they can be more openly racist because yeah. that's what the people wanted. So I've actually heard so many people's opinions and they are like, the change happening. Yeah. So yeah. Change is coming. 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 Change is coming.
No. The Church of England, which is Simulized. very close. Simulized. Very close. I, I got my guilt from somewhere else. <laughs> I, 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 uh, C of E. And it was more or less looks like the Catholic Church in terms of iconography and sort of all, all the stuff. Um, thank you so much for your talk, um, Jeremy. Uh, I mean, I'm just here to ask again, and I, I do know your work, but just seeing you right now and presenting all of these different works, I'm really struck by all of the war, the Battle of Fulcri, and the Iraq War, and your work with the soldiers, and then you wear a t-shirt that says Aries, and I think you're an Aries as well, and the God of War. Don't, yes, I'm an Aries. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just like, we're taking it in visually, there's a lot like, I'm thinking, God of War, and War, Battlefield, yes, and there's just... Well. So much war, I'm wondering what your personal connection and fascination is to like war and conflict, what you keep bringing you back to that? I don't know, I think you know, conflict is a very good thing to, you know, as any art creative person to write about and make a film about, you know, it's what keeps narrative and drama going, isn't it? The idea of conflict, it's like what all kind of pop drama is about, isn't it? It's like the two sides, so there's that. Also, I hate, um, as most of you probably do, I hate confrontation, confrontational situations, I'm very bad in them. And also, I hate the idea of being around big groups of men. I don't like men very much in groups. Uh, you know, I don't like, my absolute nightmare of all time is like being on a train with uh, football fans or rugby fans or, or a stag night. You know, stag nights for me are absolutely kind of the end of the world. So I'm not really into sort of maleness in that way. So in a sense, I make a lot of work about that, about groups of men. Maybe as a way to sort of um, deal with my sort of fear of groups of men, if you call it that. Because um, I never was in sport ever, you know, so that's, uh, it's, it's, that's probably one aspect of it, because it's not me really, you know, but I'm interested in it, but I don't want to be it. Uh, at the yeah. back. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I thought that your uh, film, Everybody in the Place, about the 80s and 90s in Convene Street Britain was super fascinating, really inspiring to me. I feel like that's a lesser known part of our cultural history, even for people of our generation, if there's a lot of sort of brain fog about what actually happened in the time leading up to now. Mm. You just spoke about you know, your hatred of your uncomfortability around sort of stack do kind of blood culture. And for me, it kind of raves a kind of the anathema to exactly that sort of feeling. Um, back in 2020, I actually made a sound system with some friends, and we've been doing some raves over the last few years as a way of bringing friends and the community together. Nice. And it's been really incredible, starting from small groups to much bigger groups. And I just wanted to ask you if you've had any thoughts, if any, on how rave could make a comeback in Britain and what the kind of enduring influence might be of that. Well, I think the enduring influence is a number of things. I think it's very inspiring to younger people, like yourself. I'll call you a younger person, because you really are from me. So I think there's a lot of people are fascinated by that moment in British history, because they were, weren't even born at the time when it happened, but they hear about it, and it becomes mythical almost. And so there's that idea of trying to create something or recreate something. Uh, so, I think Spirit of Rave is very interesting because everyone goes on about punk, don't they? Like Spirit of Punk, Punk this, Punk that. And no one really thought about dance music having that kind of rebellious spirit the way the punk did. And I think we, we now understand that actually 1987 to 1990 was as important as the punk. When punk happened, and it was like this massive social change was happening. Especially with digital culture, not necessarily the internet and stuff, because it's just before, but people were changing their ideas. They, they, so the government for years and years, and it was a massive shift for young people. And I think a lot of people that went through the rave era have gone on to do things which they never thought they'd do because that inspired them to do it. So, and the sense of community that we were talking about is amazing when you start playing music, and, and that was a really important thing as well. So, I think it's it's influencing the culture. You can't necessarily pinpoint one this thing particularly, but I, I think it, it's just spread out. And I find it, that, you know, if I meet people my age, I can tell if they went to raves and if they did all that at the time. You, they're just different. And if they get house music or they don't, they're pre-house or post-house. It's like sort of BC, AD. Are you house, are you not? And so you get, as soon as you talk to someone, you see. I mean, look at me, I'm dressed like a 20-year-old 
from 1990. I wouldn't say I dress like this all the time, but when it's hot, I just wear clothes that I would have worn then, you know, because it's the most comfortable thing. Yeah. So I think it has huge, huge influence uh, And the drugs were very helpful for a lot of people as well. It made people emp empathise and like each other, which was very necessary in the 80s, because they wanted to hate each other, and the government had turned everyone on, a bit like now, really, had turned the country in on itself and to attack each other like a civil war, kind of cultural civil war was going on. And so rape to put people together in a way that um, hadn't really happened before. Punk didn't do that. And so you see you see echoes of it in music, but also in people's behaviour and people trying to recreate it. You do your own version, which I think is great. Oh right, you know. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm really fascinated by your kind of I guess desire to like capture a moment. So I'm really curious with regards to this documentation, how you would consider, or what you would consider to be like the best form of like documentation in terms of time. Like obviously these people are very sort of emotionally fueled by like the tensions at the time, but what well, these people? Yes. Yes. And then like the situation. And I'm sorry, I'm American, so That's I fine. Don't, I don't apologize for foreign to me, but yeah. yeah. Um, well, you have a similar kind of people in America. I mean, this is we, we kind of got it from you. Yeah, not, I'm not blaming you personally, but no, that's, it felt that's like America. Yeah, it felt like America being there. Yeah. yeah, but what would you consider to be kind of a more or the best way to like document in terms of time, like this uh, sort of interrogation of someone um, that experiences like 20 years from now? How would that compare to well, someone who actually experiences this now? I actually think that the film I made. It was very scrappily made, it was just me often, with a, not even with a video camera, but with a stills camera on video setting. Okay. Uh, or I had a, I had a, a small, I had a, I had a cameraman who was shorter than me, Jew, Jewish, being sort of like, people talking about Jews in like terrible ways, not even realising he was Jewish. And we, but, but we were like two small men walking around, all these big beefy blokes and sort of strange people, and just getting them to talk to us, because it was so unthreatening. And so, Sorry, I'm, I'm getting to your answer. And so the film has an immediacy about it. I mean, technically, it's not good. The sound there was shit. I don't know if you noticed. But for some reason, I don't know why. But um, basically, we were sort of right in the middle of this thing, just like pointing the camera when you see it, and you go like this. And it was just chaos. And the film has a kind of immediacy to it because it's sort of chaotic film because of the situation. So in a way, if you want to know what it was like to be in this place in Parliament Square, this film actually is quite good because it's not made like a news report. It's really kind of in the sort of grassroots, getting a bit dirty with people as it were. And so I would say it's probably over time will have some sort of social value. Well, I hope it does, but we don't, you know, don't know. It's not very watchable because it's so unpleasant. It's really, it's a film you should, you have to really watch with, with people. Otherwise, I don't think you could watch, watch it all the way through because it's so depressing. It's, it's good to watch it and laugh. Because like that woman, she's comical. She's terrifying as well because it just shows how easy it is to be brainwashed. And if you read the Daily Mail, you end up on sort of websites and watch today to be all kinds of nonsense. Thank you. That's all right. At the back. No. You're not going to Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm also an artist at the Ruskin. I just wanted to ask a question about money. Um, I'm quite interested in you kind of saying these things about, you know, you work as a technician, you lived with your parents, and then you're showing us all of these, like, um, projects gorgeous. that are quite large scale, yeah. uh, where you clearly have to have access to, like, really good equipment and enough money to be able to employ people. And then, you know, at the end of your, um, you know, you talked about doing print sometimes, and then at the end of the film that you showed us, it said, like, Gucci and something else. So just, if, okay. if you're willing, like, I don't know, absolutely. money would be okay. a great thing to talk about. Sure, I'll talk about it. I'll, I'll, start, I'll start at the beginning. I'll start with the brass band. So that was an open invitation to, uh, to, to write in an idea about music and art. So I did that. And the budget was £2,000. And basically the whole budget went on paying the band to play. It's like £1,500 and paying someone £500 to do the score. So that, that's fairly straightforward. It's quite a low budget really for like a, what is effectively quite a big production. You have a whole band playing music for you and they get £1,500 quid. It's ridiculous. And then things, 
And then but the thing with the miners' strike, which I, again I wrote in, they didn't really know who I was, but the idea kind of turned on a switch with them, or whatever. That budget was huge and it was paid for by a Channel 4. It's over half a million pounds. I don't get involved in the budgeting or the fundraising, I have to say. And then, of course, once you reach a certain point in your career, people will uh, want to work with you and they will have a budget. Most of the time, you rarely see any of the budget for yourself often, but you get to spend money occasionally. The Gucci thing, yes, Gucci did sponsor. But originally, that, that film is an hour long. And they were making four 15 minute films about dance music, just, and, uh, and they asked me to make one of them. I didn't realize it was only meant to be 15 minutes long, but it was. And I made an hour long documentary. So my budget went on archive, it didn't go on with performers or dancers or whatever. But, you know, to be honest, you know, okay, fashion world, whatever, it's, there's a lot of those people who can sponsor your work for the Gucci. And I didn't really. I was quite happy to take their money and make an artwork out of it, or a, a proper documentary, as I will call it. Um, also, you can't make a 15 minute film about that subject. If you did, you'd be laughed out of. You'd never be able to show your face again. You had to make a sort of serious film about what I feel is a very serious underlooked part of British culture. So, yeah, they sponsored it. So the money comes from different places. I suppose that's what I'm trying to say. And you take it where you can. Of course, there are red lines about who you would and wouldn't want to pay for things. So the, this film was paid for by a festival in Austria. So it's just opportunities from where they arise. You try and use things. I mean, the budget wasn't even that big. And, you know, making films is insanely expensive, even when you do it so, you know, in a sort of haphazard way, in an amateurish way that I did. But um, the Prince thing, yeah. Was that, that to answer your question? Money, you know, if you're lucky, you money, people want to work with you, and if you win the Turner Prize, then that helps, you know, all these things help. But it's amazing how you still don't get paid a lot of time as an artist, mm -hmm. it's incredible how you end up spending your own money because things, the budget isn't enough and they haven't budgeted for your fee, and I know that happens to me all the time. So people say, oh, the commercial art market's terrible, it's really bad, it's really wicked, it actually subsidises your work. To use it as a way to substitute. It means you can do other things because no one's going to buy this film. It's so horrible in a way. You have to give you have to give films away basically. But it means if you can sell work and you can survive and to make things and spend a year doing something for six months. Okay, that lady at the back. You have your hand. You're right next to her. Hello. Um, I know you spoke earlier about you not being a traditional filmmaker. Um, is there something from your art history background that sort of influences the aesthetics of how you choose who to interview, or is that something? Well, because I look like a Broyle painting or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> Which a lot of people did for that. But I mean, yeah. this, you know, let's let's talk about our history. Oops, that's these guys look like something from a Broyle painting. I mean, there was there were Broglian sort of people there. But a film less imagery more, but I suppose you have a huge image bank in your memory, if you're not a historian, of images from art history, uh, obviously. And so even without even realising, I think you sort of see something and make a connection. You think, oh, that's a bit like this, and you're not even conscious of it. So I think that does happen. And you have an eye for things, maybe an eye for detail, or, or it, it starts a sort of associative uh, stream of consciousness. So it wasn't all wasted being an art historian for three years, you know. And I studied Baroque painting, so it's 17th century painting, which is all really, more or less 80% religious art, which I love. But, um, and maybe I'm bringing, you know, it's, it's showing itself without me even realising it. Sorry, I'm just trying to find some. So this guy, this is one of the conspiracy theories we've talked about. I know I have to finish in a minute, but if there's any more time, or what's going on with the timing? So? What's that? Five minutes. Okay. If there's any more questions, this guy here. Oh no, this is the reason I'm doing. I was wondering, like you said, that you use some public material, like as a physical working artist. 
you kind of get, I don't know, you kind of learn how material works. You get kind of frustrated with it, or yeah. do you find that with just the puzzle of the material? Well, actually, not really. I mean, that, that's, I wish I hadn't said it like in those terms, because it sounds a bit creepy, is it? It's not just material, but I'm interested in people, as I'm sure we all are, and so I just. I, can, I, can, I suppose I can emphasize, empathize with people who I actually have nothing in common with. Maybe that's something. But yes, of course, if, when you work in the public realm or with the public or something for the public outside, you have no control really over what's going to happen. I mean, you control it in a film and edit, but if you're making a, a public event, you can't even control the weather, which is really important. But you can't really control how people receive it or how they're going to think about it. But I quite like that random quality to working in the public realm or working with the public. Because often the public will make your work better. That's what you really want, to bring something and improve on work, on your idea. Which does happen. I couldn't tell you where or when, but it does happen. Thank you. Also, I think is um, we'll to it. the E equals MC squared tattoo, I think might be a reference to the atom bomb. Oh yeah, I think yeah. it probably is. Yeah, that's one of the more straightforward ones, I think. But uh, yeah, but most of it was referring to the Bible, a lot of it was referring to the Bible, sort of the Old Testament, sort of apocalyptic situations and so on. Okay, anyone else? Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, because Well, that's a good that's a really good question because the, the, the thing with the soldiers, I didn't want it to be nostalgic. But as soon as you put someone in a uniform, people will become nostalgic. You can't help it. But I really did. I wanted to avoid nostalgia. I wanted to avoid. I wanted to make something that was slightly creepy, if anything, that was settling. To avoid the nostalgic interpretation of the First World War, because no one's alive really can remember the First World War or can remember the song. There's no one alive who was at the song. So that's a very dangerous moment when people become nostalgic for something that they weren't been around for, or they can't remember, or even their parents can't remember. So I did want to avoid nostalgia because it's like a really, it's a really negation of the future and the present, and it's really a sort of dangerous thing. It's, it's a dangerous story we tell ourselves about something, and that's kind of what happened with Brexit. You know, it was a, it was a nostalgia um, event, effectively. But people have it in them, so you can't control the public. That's another thing I've got. Unfortunately, they can't be controlled. I'm sort of right to something. Okay, there's one more question here. No, I need one. And maybe that's it. That's a spell. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the talk. Um, it was interesting to have you start with augury and it came with Brexit. And so begin with this moment of, like, you know, Decimation of the trade unions, you know, then to kind of organise labour as like a force in British politics, um, and then end with this like completely inchoate kind of protest that you know assembles rage from like a much broader section of British society than of course the one that gathers in Parliament Square because you, you you've got you've got like the nut jobs, but you know yeah um, like half the family it's, 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 it's like um, so I guess my my question is like, you know, at how far do you see this kind of arc of your work wow. as being about this lots of political alternatives? And do you think, what, where can we look? I mean, <laughs> I can't answer the second question. <laughs> but the first question, I think, I think you're very, you're correct because you know Brexit started in 1985. In some respects, when people were like thrown on were like totally abandoned in those areas that voted heavily for Brexit, or well, the mining areas were massively heavily voted for Brexit, and then they voted for the Conservative Party or far right parties. So they absolutely banned, weirdly, but Conservative, because they were abandoned by the Conservatives, then Labour, and then the Conservatives again. But yeah, the beginning of Brexit and the sort of this sort of populist movement, you could argue, starts after the miners' strike. People's absolute trauma and resentment of what happened to them translates into anti-EU, it's like funneled into anti-EU sentiment. Probably because of the press, it's very, it has been anti-EU forever. You know, the Brexit campaign has been going 
It's going on for 30 years before it's actually cool. You know, you look at any newspaper from the 80s, most newspapers have actually hated the EU. Uh, so, yeah, you make a good point, but I don't know what, I have no idea what the future is going to be. <laughs> Do you see your art as, as generating some kind of alternative? Do you see it as speaking perhaps to some of the people who like, lack that kind of alternative? Or? Maybe. I mean, art has many. It's a way of dealing with things, isn't it? So it's a way of dealing with these appalling events, trying to understand them and, and make more sense of them, effectively. And uh, also, it shows the way forward as well, like music does. Music is a great quote, so music is a prophecy. In, in a way, that's what house music was, and maybe that's what art can be. It can show you a different that's an alternative future or reality. Which is a very good, I think it's a very good end. <laughs> <laughs>